Hello, everybody. Uh, it is uh, Jose Garza, and it is a pleasure on behalf of the AMS to welcome you to this webinar tonight. It is a very exciting topic, and I am sure it will stimulate a lot of conversation and questions. So I want to remind you to please submit your questions in the Q&A box, not in the comments. And uh, any questions that go unanswered um, will advance to doc matters and you'll be answered through them and it will be addressed. I want to introduce our moderator for tonight, Dr. Baha Moshiri. She's a professor of medicine and director of motility in the division of gastroenterology at Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, she has a master's degree in clinical investigation, has received Perceptor of the Year Award, Academician of the Year from Atrium Health in 2020, She's currently on the AGA's Institute Council. She's also a council member of the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility, and she currently serves as the ACG governor for North Carolina. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Mushery. Thank you, Jose, and thank you everyone for joining us for this really exciting topic. We're, um, it's a pleasure to have the best speakers today on the topic of SIBO, which not only gets a lot of media attention, social attention, but also um, has a lot of guidelines recently, one of which Dr. Quigley, who will be giving us a talk on today, will be discussing. So our first speaker, we have two wonderful speakers. The first one is Eamon um, Quigley, and he is the David Underwood Chair of Medicine and Digestive Disorders. Um, he's a professor of medicine um, at Houston Methodist and at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Quigley is internationally known for his research in the area of functional bowel diseases, neuromotility disorders, um, the microbiome and its effects on the gut, and then small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. He actually co-authored and was the first author in the AGA practice guidelines that was published in 2020, along with Dr. Murray and Dr. Mark Pimentel. And so it's a pleasure to have him speak today on the clinical picture of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here today with you. And um, I want to talk to you about the clinical spectrum of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And I will do so, or I should say I should preface my remarks by saying that um, Dr. Harris's lecture, which comes later, is actually fundamental to what I'm going to say, because a lot of the disorders I'm going to mention, their definition in terms of bacterial overgrowth depends, of course, on the testing that you do and the limitations of those tests. So I like to go back a little bit in time when I talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, partly because I've been around for a long time and because I remember some of these original papers. So when bacterial overgrowth first hit the headlines, if you like, it was really as a disorder of maldigestion and malabsorption. And some of the seminal work on this was done in London uh, by these two authors and by others at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, and then also in the US. And they defined small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as a situation where there is a bacterial flora qualitatively resembling that found in the large intestine and feces, or the occurrence of a biosol tolerant flora consisting of both aerobic bacteria such as E. coli and Streptococcus and anaerobic bacteria such as Bacteroides and Bifidobacteria. There are actually some very interesting concepts there, which I will mention as we go along, but you, meant, you noticed the, the mention of a biosol tolerant um, microflora, as we would say now, micro, microbiota. Now, at the beginning, the focus, as I said, was on maldigestion and malabsorption. Then we moved into a phase where the focus really became on testing. And the first testing, which goes back to the origins of bacterial overgrowth, was, of course, the aspiration of contents from the small intestine, culture, enumeration of the number of bacteria, and then the definition of bacterial overgrowth based on an excess of bacteria in the small intestine. Originally, it was 10 to the power 5, and then later was modified to 10 to the 3, providing that the microbes that are isolated were actually those that you would normally see in the colon. Later, breath tests came on board and became widely accepted and used because they were so, so much easier to use. 
The first was a desilose test, which was abandoned. And now, of course, we rely on glucose and lactose breath tests. But there are other breath tests also, which had some popularity at some stage. And then the other approach which could be taken is you simply suspect bacterial overgrowth. You give a course of antibiotics and you see if they get better, empirical therapy. Now, one important point I want to make before we go any further is that when we talk about the definition of bacterial overgrowth on the basis of culture, we must remember that this was based on colony forming units per mil of jejunal fluid. Now, many of us, when we do aspiration, we actually aspirate duodenal fluid. And I have to insist that we have really have not uh, standardized or validated the number of bacteria in the small intestine based on duodenal aspirates as against jejunal aspirates. Now, I, the only mention I'll make about uh, testing is this slide, and uh, just to emphasize to you the limitations of uh, the breath test. So this is comparing glucose and hydrogen breath tests against aspirates, which were either culture positive or culture negative. And as you can see here, even though these were small numbers and this is a known study, you can see here there are limitations both in terms of false positives and false negatives uh, for uh, both breath tests. And this is an issue that I know Dr. Harris is going to talk about in much more detail. So we started with a clinical scenario, malabsorption. Then we moved on to testing. And I think nowadays we look on bacterial overgrowth, or we, at least I should say, we define bacterial overgrowth using a combination of definition of symptoms and tests. And these are two or three, actually three definitions which have been used recently, such as it's a clinical disorder in which symptoms, clinical signs, and our laboratory abnormalities are attributed to changes in the numbers of bacteria in or in the bacterial composition of the small intestine. A disease in which the small bowel is abnormally colonized by an increased number and abnormal types of microorganisms or characterized by the presence of an abnormal amount of bacteria in the small intestine together with the constellation of GI symptoms. You will note that these definitions are purposely vague in that they talk about symptoms in a very general sense and they refer to the number of bacteria in a fairly non-quantifiable manner. And that really is quite deliberate as we will see later. So why do people get bacterial overgrowth? Well, you can think about this in a very simple way, in a pathophysiological way, if you think about what are the normal defenses against bacterial overgrowth. They're gastric acid, intact motility, an intact ileocecal valve, an intact immune system, as well as the bacteriostatic properties of pancreatic and biliary secretions. So then, if you turn this on its head, you can see that you are likely to get bacterial overgrowth if you've got achorhydria, if you've got motility disorders such as scleroderma, if you've got anatomical defects which increase communication between the distal and the proximal intestines such as a fistula, resection, or strictures, if you've got immune deficiencies, particularly IgA deficiency, and if you've got pancreatic exome, exome deficiency. So I like to think of bacterial overgrowth from a pathophysiological perspective, and this makes it, I think, more understandable to me. Now, in the next few slides, I'm going to list a whole number of conditions that have been associated with bacterial overgrowth. Before I list any of these, I think I have to preface it by saying one has to be mindful in looking at these lists of how these disorders were defined and the limitations of the tests that were used to define them. So, for example, in Crohn's disease, where you get strictures, you can get fistulas, no surprise, bacterial overgrowth occurs. Tropical enteropathy is really based on bacterial overgrowth. And celiac disease, particularly non-responsive celiac disease, has been associated with bacterial overgrowth. Post-gastrectomy is actually one of the first scenarios in which bacterial overgrowth was defined. And then you've got a number of conditions here where there's been some association with bacterial overgrowth. Motility disorders, obvious, cystic fibrosis, scleroderma, hypothyroidism, all associated with bacterial overgrowth. There's a whole other literature, which I don't have time to go through today, which talks about bacterial overgrowth in the context of, of liver disease. And this is a very interesting uh, literature uh, where bacterial overgrowth may have a role to play, for example, in um, portosystemic encephalopathy, particularly minimal encephalopathy as shown here, and also even in the, in the direct pathogenesis of some liver diseases, such as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, but as I said, this, that's for another day. Bacterial overgrowth has been defined in 
in describing obesity in type 1 diabetes and in the context of bariatric uh, surgery. And then there are a whole host of disorders which have been described and which are very popular in the, main, in the media, as so we've already heard of from Dr. Garza. Uh, there are a lot of claims out here for bacterial overgrowth as the cause of virtually everything you can think of. Muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's, rosacea, restless leg syndrome, etc. And in many of these instances, I think we have to be somewhat uh, cautious in our interpretation because of either the number of patients who are involved, the lack of controls, or uh, the techniques that we use to define bacterial overgrowth. Now, just to put it in perspective, I want to refer to two studies which have looked at large numbers of patients who were tested and looked to see how many were positive and were there any predictors of positivity. This is a study from the Mayo Clinic from a few years ago of 675 UD Lasperitz, a retrospective study, 8% were positive overall, and the predictors were older age, steatorrhea, narcotic use, inflammatory bowel disease, small bowel diverticular, and pancreatitis. No surprises here. In fact, we've known for many years that bacterial overgrowth is a not too rare cause of unexplained diarrhea in the elderly. And of course, steatorrhea reflects its malabsorption, narcotic use, causing just hypermortality, et cetera, so no surprises here. In this particular study, only 2% of those with IBS who were tested were positive, which is probably as similar to the background rate for bacterial overgrowth. This is another study actually from Los Angeles, where they looked prospectively at 320 duty aspirates, and in this study, 19% were positive overall. But this study was very biased towards patients who had irritable bowel syndrome. And 68% of patients who are positive actually had IBS. Predictors here, not surprising, were IBS, type 2 diabetes, PPI use, and not having gastritis. Overall, they found 38% of IBS were positive for bacterial overgrowth. And this was more common in patients with um, diarrhea predominant IBS than in non predominant IBS. I'll talk more about IBS later. Now, recently, Daniel Bushyhead and I um, tried to look up the community prevalence, so the real, you know, the real world prevalence of bacterial overgrowth. And unfortunately, there really is very little data that can tell you what's the prevalence, the background prevalence of bacterial overgrowth in the community. And I've listed here a number of uh, studies from um, Europe, uh, from um, South America, from Australia, from Japan, which have looked at this. And um, as you can see here, where you have um, true um, community data, of which there's extremely, extremely limited, certainly in younger people, uh, the rates of positive bacterial overgrowth are extremely low. You can see here the rates increase with diarrhea and also the increase in the elderly. But this data really has extreme limitations because of the manner in which it was collected and on the populations that were tested. They really were not normal individuals living in the community. Now, why all the fuss about bacterial overgrowth? Well, the fuss is because it actually can have consequences. And one consequence is B12 malabsorption, which in turn can lead to mucosal changes, bile acid deconjugation, and in severe malabsorption, in severe bacterial overgrowth, you may actually get mucosal injury with loss of brush water enzymes, altered permeability, and even in the most extreme cases of protein losing enteropathy. Bacteria may digest protein interluminally and affect the nutrition of the host, and some may produce enterotoxins and thereby directly damage the mucosa. The indirect effects, of course, are nutritional, B12 deficiency, the comp competition with the host for nutrients. You may get bacterial translocation, which may lead to systemic sepsis. And there are other systemic effects that have already mentioned to the potential impact on the liver, a reactive arthropathy and other autoimmune phenomena have been described. And in severe um, bacterial overgrowth, especially in children with short bowel syndrome, an immune-mediated uh, enteropathy has been described. That appears to be quite rare. Now, in the older literature, you read a lot about pathological consequences of bacterial overgrowth of the small intestinal mucosa. But actually, in the real world today, this is actually quite uncommon. Yes, decreased villus to group ratio is more common, uh, but 
overall duodenal biopsies of patients with bacterial growth are less likely to be less likely to be judged within reference phase than controls, but this is a very slight difference. So nowadays, I think we would not expect to see major pathological changes in patients with bacterial overgrowth. So what are the clinical consequences? There may be none. There may be those of malnutrition or specific deficiencies. You may get steatorrhea. As already mentioned, you may get diarrhea, especially the elderly, and then bloating, flatulence, abdominal discomfort, and even weight loss. Now, the problem is that many of these are nonspecific, and that's where we run into a lot of trouble uh, in ascribing uh, symptoms or symptoms to bacterial overgrowth. So what are the syndromes? There's the classic malabsorption syndrome, which I mentioned. You may get altered permeability, and indeed, one important clinical point to emphasize is that you may get enhanced absorption of uh, vitamin K1, which may impact on warfarin uh, and coumadin dosing. You may get floral immune engagement, uh, with the normal flora, with an abnormal flora, this may have uh, mucosal effects or systemic effects, which I've already mentioned. Um, the, it may contribute to metabolic activity and contribute to obesity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then, of course, the most contentious issue, which I'll now talk about in some more detail, the whole issue of the relationship of bacterial overgrowth to functional symptoms and to IBS specifically. So this all began with this study from now quite a few years ago, from Mark Pimentel, where they reported that 84% of their patients had bacterial overgrowth at baseline and when tested with lactulose. And when they were eradicated, diarrhea and pain but not bloating uh, Im improved. And this was followed by several other studies from Mark Pimentel and others supporting this data, but also some other studies which were negative, which were listed here, some employing lactulose and xylose tests, some employing a glucose breath test, some employing jejunal culture, and which found no difference between uh, IBS patients and controls. One interesting finding that was confirmed uh, was that methane seemed to be associated with constipation when it was present in bacterial overgrowth. This is an important study from Magnus Simlin's group in Sweden, where they took a large group of IBS patients, all had jejunal cultures, and they actually found that the rate of um, bacterial overgrowth um, defined in the conventional sense of genetic cultures was identical in IBS and controls. However, if they took a lower threshold, they found that mild increases in bacterial counts were more common in IBS. And in that group, they found with mortality studies that enteric dysmortality was more common. So it leaves the door open a little bit. Then comes a um, meta-analysis from Alex Ford. Uh, this involved over 1,900 patients. And overall, that they found that the pool prevalence of a positive lactose of glucose breath hydrogen test was definitely higher in IBS compared to controls. No difference between jejunal aspirin and culture. The odds ratio for any positive test of bacterial overgrowth in IBS versus controls was 3.5 to 4.7, depending on the correct criteria used to define a positive test. And that last line, depending on the criteria used to define a positive test, has become the bugbear of bacterial overgrowth over the past few years. And I know we're gonna hear a lot more about that. So why do these results vary in IBS? Well, there could be some issues of patient selection like acquisition bias. There could be test artifact like diagnostic cutoff. And I'll show you a slide in a minute to show how accelerated small bowel transit may conflict, may confound matters. And there may be other confounders like obesity or PPI use, which I've also mentioned. So here's the issue of um, small bowel transit, as you can see here, some have advocated combining the uh, lactulose breath test with a sulfur colloid to allow to do radio, to detect transit of the uh, sulfur colloid and thereby to correlate secal radioactivity with the breath hydrogen arrival and they, thereby to avoid the confusion that can arise when you've got accelerated uh, oral secal transit leading to an early arrival of the lactulose in the secal. Then the question came up, could this all be due to PPIs? PPIs actually statistically are the most commonly used drug in patients with, with IBS. And was the uh, detection of bacterial overgrowth in IBS simply an artifact of their being on PPIs? And this remains somewhat unanswered. There's a large study here uh, of, of 450 patients with on PPI for medium of uh, 36 months. And they found, yes, that uh, a likelihood of a positive glucose breath test was higher or actually twice as high 
uh, and those with PPI as those with IBS and way higher than those with controls. In a retrospective study of all, over a thousand patients who had a glucose hydrogen breath test, 566 found a PPI, but among these older age are diarrhea for the predictors not being on a PPI. So this remains a somewhat controversial issue. Uh, Brendan Spiegel uh, did a very interesting, wrote a very interesting paper about this a few years ago. And he felt that it was unlikely that SIBO was the predominant cause of IBS as the lactose breath hydrogen test may not have measured SIBO for the reasons I mentioned. There's no evidence of SIBO being absent before or present after IBS emerged historically. There's no dose response between microbiota and IBS symptoms. And, but I, I would argue that maybe this has not been studied the way it should be. And the relationship between SIBO and IBS, as I've mentioned, has been inconsistent. Many IBS therapies do not address SIBO at all, yet have a more favorable num num number needed to treat than antibiotics. IBS does not behave like a traditional infectious disease. Other factors may confound the relationship. And whereas the brain gut hypothesis is evolutionary sensible, the bacterial hypothesis is harder to define from an evolutionary perspective. That was his perspective. So his conclusion that bacteria may contribute to some IBS symptoms, but can it be the only explanation the causal link between SIBO and IBS is not severe. And this is over 10 years ago. I think it still remains a very important viewpoint. So in summary, SIBO is a somewhat arbitrarily defined condition. And this definition needs revision based on modern micro microbiological methods. And I really look forward to that happening. Symptoms of SIBO of whatever cause are often nonspecific, such as bloating, distension, etc. Uh, which of course causes a lot of overlap. Causes can be predicted on the basis of a knowledge of the factors that normally prevent colonization, we mentioned those, and the precise role of C1 IBS continues to be defined, and that's the safest conclusion that I can come up with. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to uh, hearing from Dr. Harrison, and particularly look forward to hearing your questions in the discussion session. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So um, segue, great segue to our next speaker, uh, Lucinda Harris, um, Lucy, as we all call her. Lucy is an associate professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, um, Arizona. And she um, did her fellowship at Wild Cornell Medical College. And she is also faculty now at um, Mayo Clinic. She's a staunch advocate for patients. She's a fantastic role model for all of us, she's actually part of Rome 5 and she's doing the age, race, gender, women's health and um, running that patient committee. She's a member of the AGA, she's an AGA fellow, she's an ACG fellow, and we're just really honored to have her speak about bacterial overgrowth. Um, and she has a very broad area of expertise, of course, IBS, celiac, and autoimmune disorders included. Thank you, Baha, for that very nice introduction. And uh, let's see if we can share the screen here. Sorry, technology is not our friend. Here, share screen. There we go. Got it. All right, and let me just get it into pink slides. Best slides in the world. <laughs> I love this background. Uh, and then this place. And... Okay, I think we're all set now. Just going to move all the people over to my other screen. Um, so thank you, Eamon, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, ANMS and, and Baja for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, these are my um, uh, my disclosures and just I think it's important to also know that most everything we're discussing tonight is totally off label and not FDA approved. Um, Eamon has uh, kind of identified diagnostic criteria and risk factors for developing small bowel intestinal bacterial overgrowth and we're going to examine some of the controversies in diagnosis right now and um, hopefully we'll get a little chance in the discussion to talk about both of us about uh, treatment. So what about the diagnosis of SIBO? Well I, I think I can um, uh, summarize this whole area in one word uh, and that is controversial. So you know 
Emin has um, outlined to you the um, clinical criteria that are somewhat criteria are, are somewhat controversial. Uh, the tests that are available for the diagnosis of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth um, are often not available everywhere, and that's uh, clearly shown in intestinal aspirates. And the most recent guidelines from the North American consensus um, found that unlike, you know, previous, the historical definition of uh, in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that instead of 10 to the fifth colony forming units um, per milliliter, we should now use a newer cutoff of 10 to the third. And that could either come from a duodenal or a jejunal aspirate, as opposed to um, in the past where it was defined as only from a jejunal, jejunal aspirate. Um, ultimately, you'd like to get three to five cc's of liquid fluid aspirated from this area, but always challenging is to, um, to uh, practice a sterile technique in doing this. That's very uh, uh, difficult. Uh, Dr. Rao's uh, article, which I uh, will uh, reference later, actually has a nice explanation of how he does it. Uh, but doing a duodenal or jejunal aspirate is an invasive and expensive way of trying to diagnose small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that's why breath testing sort of came into being. And uh, there are two different kinds of breath tests that are clinically available right now. As uh, Dr. Quigley pointed out, uh, D-xylose testing used to be used, but now we are using glucose and lactulose. It's important when you do this breath testing to get the correct dose of substrate. So for a glucose breath test, that's 75 grams of glucose. For lactulose, that's 10 grams. And you're taking breath samples every 15 minutes over 90 to 120 minutes. And according to the new guidelines, what you're looking for is a greater than 20 part per million rise from baseline for hydrogen. Um, within 90 minutes and a greater than 10 part per million rise from baseline for methane at any point in time. And that defines what we call intestinal methanogen overgrowth. It's important to realize that actually when we're looking at methane, we're not looking at bacterial overgrowth, we're looking at um, methanogens and methanogens belong to the genera of archaea rather than to bacteria. There are also important um, consensus guidelines that ha were were um, that came out in 2017, and I think these are important to be aware of. You know, like uh, gastric emptying studies. Not everybody follows these criteria, and if you don't, then you run the risk that your tests will be less less accurate. So patients shouldn't have taken antibiotics for four weeks before testing. They need to avoid laxatives and promotility agents for a whole week before testing. They need to have a proper fast period of eight to 12 hours and avoid fermentable carbohydrates before their testing. And during the test, they're actually supposed to do minimal exertion and avoid cigarette smoking. And then I think an important point is that once they have the substrate, they're supposed to take uh, a cup of water with or following uh, the substrate. So this is kind of the uh, old picture that we may be familiar with. There are different symptoms. This picture kind of illustrates the Quintron um, system and the patient being um, in, the, in our area for testing. Um, this is the glucose test. I wanted to point out, you know, the criteria for hydrogen and CH4, and this is where the controversy comes in. There are some proponents that have said that we should look at the combination of hydrogen and methane gas, but this has not been validated, and, and it is advised by the uh, ACG guidelines to not use this criteria. And now in the age of COVID, what we switch to is actually using a lot of home breath testing. But before I go into that, I'm just gonna to point to some other controversies in breath testing. And so what we 
are now starting to realize that actually breath testing may provide an incomplete picture of the fermenting dynamics of the gut, because actually what we're looking at when we test uh, for uh, hydrogen is the fermentation of carbohydrates by the bacteria in the gut. And maybe hydrogen really doesn't correlate um, by um, to what's actually happening in the gut. And that's why there is production of methanogen. And now uh, we're starting to realize, particularly in patients with diarrhea, that there may be increased hydrogen sulfide gases. So if you look here, the hydrogen, um, it takes four hydrogen to produce one methane uh, uh, part per million and five um, hydrogens to produce one uh, sulfate reducing uh, bacteria. So uh, there are actually uh, commercial tests that actually look at sulfide. And so we're looking at look, uh, doing future studies that may measure all three of these gases. And there may be also a role of mass spectroscopy in measuring volatile gases as well, as well that we are not realizing may also play a role. Uh, so what does a positive breath test looks like? Uh, panel A shows a hydrogen uh, breath test that's positive uh, to suggest uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The dotted line uh, reflects methane. Uh, the solid line per, um, um, suggests hydrogen, and this is plotted over a period of uh, 120 minutes. Panel B shows you the positive uh, methanogen uh, bacteria, uh, or bad, I shouldn't say bacteria, uh, methanogen overgrowth. And panel C shows you what a normal breath test looks like. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes and talk to you about commercial breath testing, which in this age of COVID has kind of taken over uh, for many of us as a means of uh, testing patients for bacterial overgrowth. You should be aware that there are six commercial companies that offer breath testing. Uh, and the usual process is that you, the provider orders the breath test. The breath test arrives at the patient's home. And actually, uh, they can, uh, a lot of the companies have either paper instructions or little videos that you can access. Actually, at our facility here in Mayo, the nurses actually do the instruction and then send the patients home um, with the breath testing uh, kits. The breath tests are done over two to three hours in the comfort of a patient's home. And that does present a bit of a, a complication in that we can't be as sure that they're following the instructions. Uh, the patient mails the breath test back. Uh, the lab or uh, processes the sample using gas chromatography. And then they report the interpretation and that's sent back to the provider. So there are some things also that you should be aware of. Um, the out-of-pocket cost ranges from about $160 to $300. This test is not always covered by insurance. It's not FDA approved. Um, the length of testing ranges from the, in the various kits. There's actually a range from 90 to 180 minutes. Um, it, of these kits that are available, three kits look at um, hydrogen, methane, and the combination of hydrogen and methane. And these cutoffs that uh, they provide for interpreting the tests are not all in agreement with the ACG guidelines. And I've already told you that we really shouldn't be using this H2 plus CH4 guideline. One lab does hydrogen only. Only one commercial provider does the hydrogen sulfate gas in addition to the H uh, to the hydrogen and methane, and only two labs actually follow the ACG guidelines in inter in giving their interpretation. So you should realize that generated interpretations are subject to error, and you know the patient may see the report from the company and think that they have bacterial overgrowth. And you may realize that when you really look at the guidelines that they're actually not um, in compliance and maybe not um, uh, reflective of uh, true uh, bacterial overgrowth. So buyer beware on that uh, note. Uh, this is a, uh, a slide that I adapted from Dr. Rao's article in Clinical and Translational Gastroenterology. Um, again, he is more of a proponent of looking at this uh, H plus uh, hydrogen plus methanogen. Um, but I like this slide because it gives you the testing protocol. 
Uh, you should also realize that the, the new guidelines don't look for the second peak in the lactulose um, at breath testing that we used to look at. The other reason that I like this slide is it gives you a nice range, uh, as Eamon has also provided, of the sensitivity and specificity of the breath testing that we're using. You should still realize that fast gut transit can give you a false negative re uh, result in lactose breath testing. And proximal um, SIBO is, is, is um, a negative test excludes proximal bacterial overgrowth, but not back distal bacterial overgrowth in the glucose breath testing. Um, duodenal aspirates also, I just like the point that it, just the agreement in terms of this, um, uh, how it agrees with um, breath testing is about 65%. Uh, so, um, and I've already pointed out that's in base of testing. So one thing I don't think that we've emphasized is if you have patients, particularly thing, patients with scleroderma or severe bacterial overgrowth, there may be other laboratory abnormalities that you can check to actually support a diagnosis of bacterial overgrowth besides breath testing. And those are things like B12 deficiency, thiamine and nicotinamide deficiency, fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, particularly because they're due to deconjugation of bile acids. And vitamin K is very in interesting because you can either have a deficiency or an increase in levels. High folate levels are usually due to bacterial synthesis of folic acid. And severe cases, uh, as uh, Eamon has also pointed out, can cause mucosal injury and protein losing enteropathy, but that is very rare. Um, and you know the guidelines do say that there is insufficient use, particularly the AGA guidelines, to, to support the use of fecal calprotectin in diagnosing small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Certain uh, studies have looked at that as well. Uh, Dr. Moshiri may be able to provide us with a little more information on this new technology as she has done uh, some of the research for this technology, but there, uh, the detecting uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in the future may be done via uh, a, a smart capsule like this where the patient ingests it, they wear a receiver on uh, the outside. Um, it's about the, this is about the same size as the pill cam. It takes a sample of jejunal uh, fluid, measures the bacterial concentration, and transmits the data wirelessly to a receiver. Uh, and this has proved to be very uh, sensitive, about 80% sensitivity and specificity in detecting bacterial overgrowth. So I look forward to seeing more about this technology, and I'm sure there may be others out there that are uh, being developed. I'd like to thank you for your intention when I was uh, doing this study, because I have a, a new two-year-old puppy, I actually looked up small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in dogs, and they too get uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and they actually use uh, duodenal and jejunal aspirates to, um, um, to diagnose that in, in them as well. So uh, I think we can open um, uh, this to discussion um, and see what uh, we ha have to say about treating SIBO. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lucy, that was fantastic. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of questions that are being posted on the QA, so I encourage everyone to please, um, you know, post your questions on the QA section, not the chat. If there's any questions that, of course, we don't get to, um, we will answer them later on Doc Matter. Um, but at least for the time being, I think we can definitely, we have 20 minutes to actually answer a lot of the questions, which is very nice because we have the experts right here. Um, so the first question is a, um, a, a complicated question, but a very good one um, about animal models um, to study the pathophysiology of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So Dr. Quigley, um, are you aware of any good animal models for that? Yes, the, the one that I'm most aware of is a post-infection model. It's again, Mark Pimentel developed this. I think it was a compilobacter based model which he developed uh, to show that um, the development of an IBS type syndrome in that animal model was related to 
the bacterial overgrowth. Of course, going way back, there were recirculating loops, which were developed as well for the, for the um, production of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And you will, well, none of you will remember, but I, I do remember uh, several years ago when jejunal ileal bypasses were common. It was very neatly shown in an animal model that the uh, development of um, liver disease, in fact, sometimes fatal liver disease in patients who got a jejunal ileal bypass was due to bacterial overgrowth uh, in, the, in, the, in the small intestine. And they showed very nicely how by giving antibiotics, they could eliminate this and therefore prevent the liver disease. So there have been a variety of animal models developed, some of which are based on um, you know, altering the anatomy of the small intestine. Some, as I mentioned, have been based on um, the, the infectious model. How relevant they are to man, of course, is always the question. They're small animal models. Their microbiome is different to ours. Um, so I'm not sure how directly translatable but they are, but certainly there are a number of animal models that have been used. And if you're interested in looking at very basic pathophysiology of, of bacterial overgrowth, that certainly is somewhere to turn. Of course, there's a lot more literature on this now in this whole microbiome era, where there are many, many animal models. People, you know, there are germ-free animal models. It, it's, there's a whole variety of models which, are, which can be used to look at the microbiome. Can I ask a question? Question, uh, Emin. Um, I noticed that the AGA guidelines uh, actually, uh, in terms of clinical symptoms, they actually emphasize diarrhea, whereas the ACG guidelines emphasize bloating as the predominant symptom of it. Can you kind of speak to that point? I thought that was an interesting uh, point. Yes. Now, and I, I actually was, I'm going to uh, reference something you said. The impression I have, and this is just my impression from reading the literature, is that the relationship between bacterial overgrowth and diarrhea is a lot more secure than is the relationship with bloating and distension, which we expect to be the relationship. Now, why, is, why might that be the case? Well, you've actually hinted at two of them. If methanogens or sulfate-producing bacteria are going to be a, an issue, then you'd expect them to reduce gases because they actually you can use, utilize four or five hydrogen molecules uh, in, the, in those respective areas. And as you know, the evidence for increased gas production in patients with IBS, which is one of the main bloating syndromes, is actually pretty weak. And when it has been formally tested, the evidence suggests that it, rather than an increase in gas production, it may be a problem with gas transit or the sensation of gas or, or various reflex responses to gas. So, that's why I, I, I think this is an incredibly important question because yeah. bloating is the bane of my life. Um, right. And I, um, <laughs> I actually have a, one of our residents at the moment looking at our own breath testing to see how predictive bloating is and looking at you know, the series. You know, the, all the series have all sorts of problems. If you look at the series I present and there are other series as well, diarrhea still comes out as, as one of the main symptoms. Bloating, not so much. I, I agree with you. Clinically, I do agree with you. And if you look at the history of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it was most associated with con uh, conditions uh, that cause diarrhea, like scleroderma and things of that nature, post-surgical um, uh, uh, cases as well. Yes. So then another question, um, you know, do you think that it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth altering gut motility? And if so, how? Um, or is it vice versa? Yes, this is a great question. Yeah. The, the, one of the best references I can think of for that is a paper that was written many years ago, looking at patients who had, um, actually there are two papers I can think of. One is a very old paper from, actually from Gaston Van Trappen from, it might be even the 60s, where they showed a relationship between absence of the migrating motor complex and bacterial overgrowth. And that to some extent has been reproduced over the years um, by the, in the paper I mentioned from Magnus Simran's group and also from other papers, which including papers from Mark Pimentel, which suggested that uh, disorders of motility such as absent migrating motor complex predispose to bacterial overgrowth. And of course, the classic example we see all the time is scleroderma, uh, where there's maybe both neurogenic and myogenic components contributing to the bacterial overgrowth. The other uh, piece of evidence was actually from uh, a study looking at patients who had 
um, radiation interactions who do get bacterial overgrowth. And of course, they may have strictures and pooling so they make it overgrowth. But actually, um, a group in Norway several years ago showed that the, the primary reason that the people with radiation interactions got bacterial overgrowth is because of impaired motility. Now, let's turn it the other way around. Um, yes, bacteria can disrupt back, um, motility. In fact, Larry Scott, who here in Houston many, many years ago, show that various bacteria in experimental animal models could produce abnormal motility. And of course, we mentioned you know, the interaction between bacteria and bile acids, bacteria and John chain fatty acids. If you change the relationships between conjugated and unconjugated bile acids, which you will do with bacterial overgrowth, or if you produce too many short chain fatty acids, they, depending on what's produced, will stimulate motility, they will stimulate secretion, and they will cause symptoms. So, there is a complex relationship between bacteria and motility, but I think, I think we can take it as read that significantly impaired motility will predispose to bacterial overgrowth, but also that bacterial overgrowth may compound this by secondary effects on motility. Great. And then Lucy, I have a question for you. Yes. What, what do you think of the high baseline hydrogen and then what about high baseline uh, methane? Do you repeat it? Uh, you know, I think that might also suggest that there might be some, you know, dietary non-compliance. So I might be inclined to, or, or some non-compliance to the uh, guidelines that I suggested. So I think that I would tend to repeat it. Um, the high methanogen uh, baseline, it's, it, it's, it, it's greater than 10 at any point in time. So I think if they have high methanogens, that's a high, that's a, um, a positive test for intestinal methanogen overgrowth, and I don't think you need to repeat that particular um, test. Great. And then how about hydrogen sulfide? In your practice, are you testing your patients for hydrogen sulfides and which patient groups, um, if any? Well, I, I, being at Mayo, I have to follow certain rules. So um, we, it's not easy to get to the one commercial company that does do the hydrogen sulfide. But if I were to pick a group based on the data that I've seen, it would be patients that have a lot of diarrhea. I mean, according to Dr. Pimentel's data, it looks like that those are the specific subtype, right? right symptom that um, is more associated with abnormalities. The, um, and then do you guys believe in fungal overgrowth? Is that something in your practices that you test patients for um, or do you empirically treat them? Do you do aspirates? Um, I'd like to know you guys' clinical impression. I, can I, the answer is I don't. I know the, the, the data you're referring to uh, and the, the internet is full of paper on, on things about candida as they pronounce it. Um, and um, like people don't realize that candida is actually a normal commensal in the, in the gut microbiome. And there are circumstances such as those who have a short bowel syndrome, who have severe immunodeficiency, where you can get significant candida and other fungal overgrowths. But outside of that, it's an interesting hypothesis. And at the moment, I would say it remains a hypothesis. It's not something I go looking for. At the, at the moment, the only way you can look for it is by doing aspirates. And we have enough trouble getting labs to actually run meaningful assays on bacterial aspirates, on bacterial aspirates, not a mind of them for fungi. Uh, so at the moment, I think it remains an interesting area, but I remain to be convinced that it's clinically relevant outside of very limited areas, which I've already mentioned. Sure. And Lucy, what about you? You're in a um, billion dollar program over there at Mayo. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I. I test for it routinely, but I have, I can tell you that there have been occasions when we do these aspirates, particularly in very immunocompromised patients where they, they have detected um, fungal overgrowth. And then, then I think you have to look at the whole clinical picture to see whether you really think that, you know, yeast is playing a role in, in causing the symptoms. Um, but in, I would not say that I routinely test for it. Great. And then when you see these methane, um, you know, overgrowth, the methanogens, right? So high methane levels, is this from organisms in the small intestine or organisms in the colon? Um, and then are you seeing more of the hydrogen um, producing bacteria or more of the methanogen 
in your practices? Well, you know, since we do do the breath testing that detects both, uh, both of those entities, I do see the methanogen overgrowth. And I think that it does reflect what's in the small bowel, not necessarily what's in the colon, though, if you were to do, you know, uh, an analysis of the bacteria in the colon, you might find that there's increased methanogens in there as well. Great. And then what about you, Dr. Quigley? Do you, um, do you see more of the methanogen, the hydrogen, um, you know, or both? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's uh, at least the testing I do is predominantly um, hydrogen. I don't test for hydrogen sulfide at home. We do test routinely for methanogens. Um, I think the methanogen story is interesting. As I mentioned in my talk, there has been, there have been, I should say, a number of studies which have associated methanogenic overgrowth with um, constipation. I don't, and there's actually, I can see a question here in the, uh, in the chat or in the Q&A, which is asking, do I kind of routinely test for methanogenic overgrowth and constipation? I don't. I do other things, probably a lot of other things first. Uh, the problem with right? methanogenic overgrowth is treating it. Mm -hmm. So if you find it at the moment, we don't have any randomized controlled trials of treatment of methanogens. There are some studies suggesting that a, a combination of um, rifaximin with neomycin or even using uh, statins uh, may be helpful. And that remains very interesting. But for right now, as far as I know, there are not large scale randomized controlled trials confirming that that is actually would not only eradicate methanogenic overgrowth, but actually would have a clinical impact. So I think we wait for more data there. And Lucy, you have some beautiful slides here with treatment, the antibiotic treatment for bacterial overgrowth. When do you guys um, treat patients for recurrent SIBO? Like what cyclic, how do you alternate antibiotics? So it depends again on um, the patient. So I think my first uh, approach uh, is to uh, treat and see how long it takes for uh, the the symptoms to return. But if there's some if there's a patient that has a particular anatomic defect, I might use doxycycline 50 to 100 milligrams daily to twice daily on a daily basis and just continue that uh, rather than to use an intermittent course for people that are truly very severe. Um, patients who have very symptomatic from their bacterial overgrowth, have a lot of diarrhea, then those are the patients that, uh, and who are maybe nutritionally compromised by, um, by doing, uh, by having the symptoms of bacterial overgrowth by the diarrhea, then those are the people that I might do rotating antibiotics on. And just to quickly uh, answer the question about vitamin deficiencies, those are blood levels that we're checking. Yes. And are you guys routinely doing that? Like, are you doing B12? I know I, I kind of have a particular cystic fibrosis population. And so I don't do breath testing in those patients because it's not necessarily, I think, um, valid and sensitive. <laughs> but um, so in that patient population, at times I do check a folate. And I know Dr. Quigley in your AGA guidelines, I was so excited that you, you guys actually added that as one of the tests that could be done, perhaps um, high folate levels that could be consistent with bacterial overgrowth. So um, do you guys, yeah, is this something routine that you check? I think the, the B12 story is very important because I think if you, you know, whenever you see B12 deficiency, I think it's something that all, should always occur to you that you should think about bacterial overgrowth because if it's not produces anemia, then I think bacterial overgrowth is one thing to come to mind. And if, if it occurs in the context of a high folate, then bells should really be ringing all over the place. Um, and, for bacterial overgrowth. It's like the, the funny combination you get the dimorphic blood pressure you get in celiac disease reflecting the combination of iron deficiency and folic acid deficiency. Of course, they're going to be the opposite. But it is, um, it is I think B12 deficiency is something to look out for, particularly because B12 and folate are tested so commonly in people with macrocytosis or indeed maybe nothing. Uh, so it's, it's worth, uh, it, it's not an uncommon reason to go looking for bacterial overgrowth. Right. And then, um, you know, I have another question here. So the, you know, do you think that a provider should order hydrogen breath testing for constipation prior to determining if the patient is fecally loaded? I know you kind of touched base on it in terms of constipation that I think most of us do not test patients no. for constipation. 
No, I, I think I think it's I think there's a lot there are a lot of other issues to be addressed in patients with chronic constipation, and before you get to that, I agree with that. Yes. Um, and how about herbs? Um, you know, are there any herbs or complementary medicine techniques that can be used for bacterial overgrowth? There are a lot of them being used. Um, <laughs> yeah. I would say, show me the data. <laughs> <laughs> They, you know, I see this all the time with patients have like the, the imagination here is unlimited in terms of, of the ideas that, that people come up with. There are a lot of diets as well. That, you know, there's a SIBO diet, God knows what it means. Um, but um, there are a lot of, of um, you know, a variety of herbal preparations. I don't know of any data to suggest that they're effective. Um, they're probably not doing any harm, I would suspect. Uh, but I certainly not good data to suggest that they're that they're effective. That's my AMS topic for Philadelphia, so I better <laughs> I better read up on it and see if there's any there's any good data on that. Um, and then the other question that we have here that's been posted is um, you know for the diet because you touched you touched based on the diet the SIBO diet right? What is exactly the SIBO diet that you guys recommend? And then is the low FODMAP diet? Um, you know, is, has that been studied in SIBO? And do you guys think it's effective? Lucy, all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say, you know, we always do when we're going to do breath testing for fructose or sucrose, we always eliminate uh, bacterial overgrowth first because that can cause false positives in sucrose breath testing and fructose breath testing. And if I'm doing this because I not not necessarily for constipation, but for bloating, um, what I will do, I will refer a lot of patients for a trial of um, uh, of a low FODMAP diet to see if that's uh, helpful for them. And then, you know, I, I put up this other slide here. Um, you know, patients have, people have tried probiotics, but I think we have to be careful of that because it can cause lactic acidosis and, and brain fog. Um, I don't know, um, there are maybe some patient populations for which you might consider a promotility agent. Um, and, uh, you know, fecal microbiota transplant has been looked at, but I don't think it's a real entity. That kind of expanded your answer to a little bit more, but we can talk about it some more too. Eamon can give his uh, opinions on these things as well. So I, I think the, I just see here that there are three questions about chronic overgrowth. And there are circumstances where you come across chronic overgrowth. Scleroderma is a good one. Uh, jejunal diverticulosis is another where people with chronic symptoms. When you get to there, um, you really are on your own because the data, as you as you probably know, the number of randomized controlled trials in SIBO are very small. And what they are are short-term studies. So when you come to long-term treatment, you are on your own and the, you have a choice between rotating antibiotics, which makes empirical sense to avoid getting resistance or um, for doing, doing chronic use. And basically you, you, you go, you judge by, as Lucy said earlier, you judge by the patient's response. If they require, what I typically do is maybe do a month on, two, two weeks off, a month on, two weeks off, and rotate antibiotics for people like that. Um, but that's purely empirical. Uh, there isn't actually good data to support it, but it, it makes sense. And certainly has worked for me in a small number of patients where that has become necessary. In most cases, the interesting thing is that in most cases it isn't necessary, which is surprising. Yes. Um, that people either guys not treat people patients. get started with one course or maybe a few courses a year, which is surprising, but it does happen. So how many times do you guys treat patients with antibiotics um, in patients who've had a positive breath test and then um, you know who are not getting well on antibiotics and decide that it's a disorder of brain gut interaction? Probably. Yeah, well, that's where you, I think the, the first decision there is the difficult one. I think if you really think that bacterial overgrowth is not really caused their symptoms, then you shouldn't be looking for it. Because I think once you find it, it's like a lot of other things, once you find it, then you're committed to do something about it. Because then the obvious question is, why did you look for it in the first place? So I think once you've found it, you're on a slippery slope, and then you've got to treat it, 
if they don't get better, I typically don't go retesting. Um, and I don't, I, I think most people go along with that. Uh, but if they do get better, then I stop the antibiotic and see how they do. If they relapse, I may retreat them uh, and occasionally may retest them, but for, for the most part, don't do a lot of retesting. I would imagine there's patients with abdominal phrenic dyssynergia that would also test positive, <laughs> perhaps, you know, um, with breath testing. And so sometimes you do have to kind of target multiple angles. And um, absolutely. Yeah. So I think. Um, and that's where I think bloating is particularly problematic in that regard. And that's exactly. why I may be very conservative in interpreting breath tests uh, for that reason, um, because I think you can get yourself into a lot of. Not trouble, but you can you can make life difficult for yourself by over diagnosing bacterial overgrowth and chasing it when, as you say, uh, there may be other factors that should be should be addressed. Absolutely. Well, it looks like it's seven. You guys <laughs> kept this um, kept this going beautifully. And so, for any of you whose questions we didn't answer on this um, live chat today, uh, they will be answered later on Doc Matter. And so, Stephanie's going to post that and thank you so much it's been wonderful having both of you and having you embark your knowledge on us on this very tough um topic that has a lot of myths um so thank you so much thank you and thank, thank you, you to all the folks that attended today thank you